Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Health Tech Cluster Anniversary Conference panel discussion on sustainability in the health and life sciences sector. My name's Annette Bramley and I'm your chair for this discussion. I'm the director of the N8 Research Partnership, which is an alliance of eight universities in the north of England working together to make things happen. We bring the right minds together across the region to create action and innovation that will make a difference to people and businesses in the region. In this session, we're talking about sustainability in the health and life sciences sector. And the race to net zero is not only the challenge of our lifetime, it's the opportunity of a lifetime for businesses and individuals that can see the potential of the green economy. Our Net Zero North programme will provide skills and innovation for the region to help businesses take advantage of these opportunities while improving our biodiversity and our climate resilience. So for the NHS, climate change brings with it a huge variety of risks to, managers, to manage, from new diseases like COVID-19 to the impact of extreme weather on our health. And not only that, the NHS has laid out tough targets for reducing its own contribution to climate change with the ambition to become the world's first net zero national health service. An 80% reduction in carbon emissions from the NHS carbon footprint by 2028 will put the NHS well on track to meet its net zero by 2040 goal. So in the panel discussion today, we're going to hear from NHS leads who will tell us about what's already underway to help meet these targets and what they see as the biggest hurdles to making the NHS net zero. And we're going to hear from life sciences businesses that are providing solutions for the NHS and that are looking to make their own operations more sustainable and find out how business transformation can be achieved. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our great panel members to briefly introduce themselves and their organisations. First of all, Ian Stenton. Hi everybody, my name is Ian Stenton. I'm Head of Sustainability at Liverpool University Hospitals. We're one of the largest um, NHS acute trusts in the north of England. I'm also the Greener NHS Operational Lead for Cheshire and Merseyside Health and Care Partnership. Thanks. Thanks Ian. And Neil? Hi, good afternoon everybody. It's, it's Neil Hind. Um, I've been leading on this agenda for the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership for the past few years, but more recently also taken a wider role looking at sustainability across NHS England in the Northwest. Thanks. And Steve? Thanks, Annette. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Jamieson. Uh, I'm the healthcare sector lead for Siemens Smart Infrastructure in uh, GB&I. Uh, I've been working with Siemens for around five years or so now. Um, Siemens very much global innovation lead in, in healthcare services. Um, offering quite a vast range of solutions and services for the healthcare sector. We've got some real sort of deep domain knowledge in this sector. So my role within Siemens is to really sort of advise trusts, help them with certain strategies around digital innovation, ITOT integration, decarbonisation as well is quite key. And also look at sort of market trends um, and take best practices, I suppose, from global, global and example sites across the world. So. And also, I think it's, it's quite key to say, as part of a large, complex organisation, I tend to act as the conduit into that organisation for healthcare trusts as well, because it's, uh, it's never easy to navigate your, own, your way around large organisations. So, thank you. <laughs> oh, that sounds fascinating, Stephen. We look forward to hearing more about that uh, in, in a minute. Uh, Emma Southwell Sander. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Emma Southwell Sander. I work for the Science Technology Facilities Council and, and I am the uh, Energy Tech Cluster Development Manager. So based at Harwell with 57 organisations on site and over uh, 100 organisations around the UK. So looking forward to talking about the national and international links and cutting edge technologies that we have coming through uh, all relating to net zero. Fantastic, thanks Emma. And uh, Carol Treasure. Hi everyone, I'm Carol Treasure. I'm the founder and CEO of Accelerate, which is an animal-free testing lab based at SciTech Darsbury. Um, I've been working in the field of replacing animal testing with scientifically and ethically advanced alternatives for about 25 years. Um, Accelerate's been going since 2008 and we're working with a variety of companies and organisations across industry sectors um, to find safe products for humans without harming animals or the environment. Great. 
Thanks, Carol. And last but not least, Emma Degg. Oh, thank you very much, Jeanette. So I'm Emma Degg. I'm the Chief Executive of the Northwest Business Leadership Team. We're a group of um, cross-sectoral businesses, um, managing directors, CEOs, and uh, university vice chancellors from across the Northwest. And uh, my job is to seek to harness that expertise and influence for the benefit of the region's economy. Um, for the purposes of today, I don't have any of the specialisms of anybody else on the call, but I'm on the board of Net Zero Northwest, the industry collaboration that's looking to take forward specifically industrial decarbonisation for the region and work with our public sector partners on that. Fantastic. Thanks to all the panel members for their intros. And shortly I'm going to hand over to the first of our spe speakers, Ian Stenton, to kick off this discussion. But first of all, I want to remind everybody that this is an interactive session and we do want to hear your questions for the panel. So please do pop them into the Q&A and we'll pick those up after our final speaker. With that said, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Ian Stenton to open this discussion. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Annette, and hi again, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of um, where the drivers are for sustainability in the NHS, so what we're all working towards and, and how this forms part of a wider the wider discussion across the Northwest. So the Green NHS programme was launched in January last year. That was formed from the Sustainable Development Unit and based around the, um, the NHS long-term plan, which set out really clear strategy for what the NHS should be doing regarding sustainability. That focuses on reducing energy, waste and water, reducing the prevalence of single-use plastics. This is pre-COVID, so <laughs> it was an issue even then. Um, looking at the carbon impacts of anaesthetic gases and inhalers, and also our role as an anchor institution, so what we can do to deliver local social benefit. So that was a long-term plan sustainability drivers, and the Green NHS programme was set up very much around the carbon aspects of this. So how can we all trust um, and the wider health sector reduce our carbon input. In October last year, the Delivering a Net Zero NHS report was launched and that really clearly set out what our um, scope was regarding carbon um, carbon emissions and it's been really, really useful. Um, the Delivering a Net Zero NHS report set out a uh, uh, what they call the NHS carbon footprint, so where we have our own scope to, to make an impact, and the wider NHS carbon footprint plus. That's the majority of um, supply chain, and Neil will be talking about that after me. So regarding the NHS carbon footprint, as Annette said, we have a 2040 net zero target with an aim to be 80% reduced um, reduction in carbon emissions between 2028 and 2032. One of the Big impacts for um, from the majority, the majority of trusts would be um, gas use and energy use, and anyone who's involved in that type of system will know that most of the interventions we do there will last at least 10, 15 years anyway. So a 2032 target for 80% reduction when we're in 2021 is really, really tight and means that we need to start looking at some of the investment decisions we're making at the moment. The other aspects of the carbon footprint was anaesthetic gases and inhalers and looking to move to lower carbon versions of those, looking at waste and water and also things like business travel and our fleet. So the net zero report has been really great in that it, for NHS trusts it clearly sets out what we need to be working towards and, and the targets importantly as well. They're based on 1990 targets, the same as the Climate Change Act, but the majority of NHS Trust would be lucky in that. Our ERIC report and so our annual estates reports go back to at least 2007 8 which is usually a comparator compar year for 1990. So the, my role with the um, Chester and Mersey Greener Chester Mayside Health and Care Partnership, that's the Greener NHS operational lead. And the new Greener NHS team is very regionally focused. So it's, it's changed from being a national directive to working locally. So we have um, a Chester and Mersey group, Greater Manchester and Lancashire and South Cumbria in the Northwest. And we all meet monthly and are working with our own ICS matches to make sure that all the trusts have green plans so they understand the carbon footprint and the actions needed to get to the targets and that there's um, operational leads. So over the next um, 
year or so, we'll be working with all the trusts in the Northwest to make sure that they know their targets based around this net zero report and that we'll be looking for partnerships and innovation to try and address some of these issues, like I say, with particularly with gas and, and heat that's, and single-use plastics, it's really difficult to, to get towards. So I'm happy to take any questions about um, the problems that we have as an NHS and what we're trying to do regionally to address those. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. That's a that's a really great uh, start off to to really give us the context and the background. And it's great to hear that that you're working right across the northwest to to bring all the trusts along. Uh, Neil is going to be our second speaker. So Neil, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm really going to build on what Ian's Ian started with in the next next few minutes that we've got to get into some of the detail on 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 some of the projects. Some of the work I'm going to focus on has been done in the the Greater Manchester region in the main and although there's been a massive focus on our on our trust on our on our hospitals we've also included our the work you know some of our colleagues in in, in primary care and social care as well the big focus really is on where we can influence on on the carbon emissions and about 60 percent over six percent is carbon emissions in the nhs come from the things that we buy uh, uh, the medicines equipment or other things in the in the supply chain so that's had a massive focus inhalers as mentioned by ian is a massive five percent of the nhs carbon emissions and we know there are there are different inhalers now in the market that don't have the, the same the same um, harmful gases that, that are in use now, so that's had a massive amount of um, amount of focus. I think energy, some of the things in the states, very well talked about and more well known, and you know implementations there are, are already underway. I think an area which interests me is single use plastics recycling and also reuse. What more can we do there? We, the feedback we get from our hospitals, our um, um, our theatres is when things arrive, they're often in plastic and cardboard boxes, lots of lots of it to, to keep the items safe, which is fine. But is there more we can do around that better recycling? We've done some of the easy stuff. So the catering products in the main has been done. We've taken those out. We've moved some of the single use plastic items to paper pulp. Um, starting to look at remanufacturing of equipment. So when things have been sold as single use, actually, are there things there we can do so we can we, we can use them a second time or a third time? There's also massive amounts of waste as well. Um, we've got a new project underway looking at recycling walking gates. Um, anyone that's had a hip operation, knee operation, elderly parents may find a number of walking aids and sticks in their shed, in their in their lofts. How can we get those back in back into circulation? Um, also, a big big um, emphasis on on fleet as well. Um, how can we change, you know, some of the fleet that we buy in the the grey fleet, grey fleet salary sacrifice. Interesting fact, we've just had about 80% of the vehicles which are being ordered now in the NHS are either ultra low or electric vehicles, which is, a, which is a massive amount and was a figure that really, really, really surprised me. I think about 40% of the NHS buy at the moment is battery only, which is against an industry average of about eight. So those are the things that we buy, uh, but again, how can the NHS become more sustainable overall? We're going to continue looking at scope three uh, emissions and what more can we do there? But also to look at with the things we buy, can we bring in additional, additional social value? Can we start to play more with the NHS being an anchor institution? Can we work closer with suppliers? and get them just to do a bit more for us and start to think about their impact as well on the health and the environment that they are working in. Linked with that, can we do more spend locally? Can we work more with SMEs and firms in, in the Northwest? Um, and we've done some early analysis on that in the 10 trusting in, in GM, where we know our local spend is about 37% at the moment, which is higher than the government target of I think about 33 but for those those organizations it ranges from about nine percent to about 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 fifty percent so why are some spending more in the region than others is it that they're on the edge of the border for example so lots of opportunities um i think lots of opportunities for us to work much much closer with industry 
and and our suppliers and i think it's um it's an ambition that we all need to get on board with great thanks neil that's a, that's a fascinating introduction and i'm sure uh, i've got some questions uh, uh, that spring to mind uh, but really great to hear about the local procurement i think especially in the in the region um, so next, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Jameson from uh, Siemens to expand on his, uh, his very interesting earlier comments and tell us a bit more about what, what Siemens are doing to support hospitals. Thanks, Annette. Thanks for that introduction. So, yeah, there's a few, uh, there's, I suppose there's quite a few different areas that Siemens assist the healthcare sector in, in decarbonisation in general. So there's the whole aspect of decarbonising existing estates. How do you build a new facility net carbon zero and what technology should you be thinking about in that respect? But then there's the whole smart, sustainable hospital uh, conversation as well. So uh, next slide, please. And I've just got a few um, points today to talk around with really what, what is a smart hospital? There's a question I get asked an awful lot. I want a, a smart hospital. What does that mean to you? What are your use cases for that smart hospital? So Really, the health sector in in a smart hospital aspect towards the seam as a smart hospital is one that delivers positive impact. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice today a little bit. Positive impact on both patients and creates an efficient and sustainable hospital operations. So on the screen here, you can see a few sort of facts and figures around some of the technology we can use to create that sort of sustainable, sustainable workplace. So on average, uh, just, I'll just read through these. On average, uh, medical staff spend around 72 minutes studies show per, per shift looking for colleagues or looking, trying to locate equipment and multiply that out across the number of staff across the NHS in the UK alone. And that's a significant, uh, that's a significant figure of, of wasted time. Of all of that equipment, it's expensive and the studies we've done sort of show that 40% or less of that is in use at any one point in time and there's associated high costs in loss of that equipment or, or the theft of that equipment as well. So we look to do uh, sort of implementation of advanced IoT infrastructure to capture that positional data of equipment, patients or staff. This location data then can be sort of integrated into a workflow support system to optimise the efficiency and improve the patient experience as well. Um, when we look at sort of the 20% fewer uh, figure around absenteeism and illnesses, the more you create a healthy environment for your employees, uh, a healthy, happy workplace is a, is a happy workplace. Staff often feel empowered by sort of digital technologies that optimise their efficiency, and particularly in the nursing environment, the more efficient you are, the more time you've got to spend looking after your, caring for your patients effectively. And then we look at hospital-related infections. So we tend to look at, I think there's a figure there around over 4 million cases across Europe of hospital-associated infections. So we look at pressurization technology. So room pressurization is used quite significantly in labs, clean rooms, isolation rooms, and, and operating theatres. However, we're starting to look at, well, can we pressurize wards? all the facilities within a hospital to reduce the spread of bacteria. This is quite widely happening now across the US. So there's guidelines in the US for pressurizing either single occupancy rooms or, or multi-rooms, um, multi-bed wards, sorry, um, to actually prevent the spread of bacteria. So, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so this just sort of walks you through a uh, I suppose a day in life is potentially what I, a small hospital could look like. So from the real, the sort of the digital check-in um, from through an application on your phone, you know, the patient receives all the hospital check-in information, they check in online before arrival at the hospital, they can reserve their own parking space and access is granted through AMPR or license plate recognition systems. And then actually once in the facility, again, through your handheld device, you've got an application on the phone to orientate yourself within the hospital, find your way from point A to point B, and look at that sort of turn-by-turn -turn navigation effectively. So it's a, it's a Google Maps effectively for inside a building. I, I've lost track of the number of times and hours I've spent wandering around hospitals trying to, trying to find the estates department or, or a particular department for a meeting I'm meant to be at. So 
And then just flip that over to the, I suppose the staff side of it, again, we just touched on staff locating equipment efficiently and quickly to be able to, to get to that equipment and locate it efficiently. And also this, this is quite a key, key figure for, for patients in some of the studies we've done that actually having control of their own environment, so particularly in a single bed occupancy room is being able to interact with their environment, control their own shading, control their own light conditions, their own temperature, um, and, and also order their own sort of meals through the, uh, the patient information systems. Um, on top of that, from a staff's perspective, we look to sort of implement and enhance that technology for staff to be able to quickly locate free meeting rooms if they need a, uh, an immediate meet a meeting room, uh, so they can do that and book that facility. Um, and then reporting issues, so again, something doesn't work, you raise a flag or a works order for that particular issue, you raise the issue and that automatically gets, gets action through, through the FM team. Working through to uh, sort of notifications about um, incidents, mass events that could be happening within the facility, in the facility. So again, that could be a security issue, it could be a fire, um, it could just be a notification that a particular event has started. But again, all that is done through applications on, on handheld devices. So, and then really at, at the, uh, the latter stages of the process, we look to give all that checkout information again, all that health recovery plan is then passed on to the patient through the um, through the handheld device and that, that application on the handheld device. So it's, it's another sort of spin on sustainability, I suppose, creating that, that healthier environment. So, so that's it from me, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. And you're right, sustainability has a lot of different dimensions uh, to it. So uh, yeah, it's good to, good to reflect on that. Um, so if I could ask uh, MSF Will Sandler to uh, talk about some of the, the projects that, that are going on at, at Harwell. Uh, thank you, Annette. So I think so running the energy tech cluster at Harwell, <clears throat> um, there, there are three main streams that come through that I think are particularly relevant to the health sector. So that's really looking at sustainability across sites or campuses, uh, waste and transportation. Um, so when we're talking about sites <coughs> across our campus, for example, um, we're really thinking about the expertise and equipment that we have to test, validate and showcase cutting edge net zero technologies. So in relation to sustainability and transportation, that could include projects on battery research, uh, storage, electronics, PV and EV charging. So we have new game changing um, developments by innovative SMEs. So within my group, I've got a, a great example is, is QDOT, uh, an SME that's been developing battery thermal management technology, uh, which enables faster EV charging uh, with smaller batteries at lower cost, which give, can get, give consumers a longer driving range uh, and save them the worry of losing battery power. So we're really you know, looking to collaborate and coordinate across the different organisations in the cluster, linking into the government's push for net zero. Um, they published this 10 point plan linking to the green industrial revolution. I think that really highlights the scale uh, of the challenge and the ambition to meet it. So the vision behind the Energy Tech Cluster at Harwell is to support the government in this endeavour by working alongside policy makers to accelerate and integrate multiple efforts from across the UK who can address a whole range of net zero applications, um, which collectively can shift the dial towards this target. Uh, an example strategy that I would like to highlight, highlight is a development that we have around a net zero living laboratory. Um, the idea of the Living Laboratory is to look at multiple users uh, and facilities across the site and, and make sure that it's a good place to develop, test and evaluate, refine novel energy systems in a real world environment before they're rolled out more widely. And this can accelerate the development of new solutions with the added advantage um, you know, that we have a wide variety of technical knowledge uh, that's embedded and, and linked closely to our campuses. Um, the campus itself is developing at pace and has a vested interest in trialing and, and adopting new sustainable solutions. So STFC and UKRI can really use its convening power to bring together the full value chain of stakeholders 
from customers and end, end users to regulators, community leaders and government to ensure that products are developed uh, and ready for market rollout from incubation to acceleration. I see this as fitting quite closely um, you know, with, the, with the NHS, with the health sector across their sites. So you know, just, just to summarise, really um, looking at, at campuses and sites to test, validate, showcase net zero technologies that are coming through around battery research, storage, electronics, PV, EV charging, uh, deploying and integrated energy systems. So with us, we have we work particularly closely with our Daresbury site, um, which has the Hartree data center. There's a large piece of this is around digital transformation. So data integration production, how we ma man managing and monitoring uh, energy consumption in buildings, for example, um, looking at integrated smart energy systems uh, with design and architecture of new data systems required <coughs> to manage with usage uh, and align to supply and demand. Uh, and then really, you know, when we're looking in my group about cutting energy, uh, cutting edge technologies that are coming through, driving that net zero innovation um, across the UK with supporting governance, policy and regulation. Um, so, so really pulling all of that together. We, we have a proof of concept program, uh, which includes a de demonstration element where we're looking to de-risk innovation and, and forge new collaborations across our network and really support those innovative innovators across uh, industry, government, academia, and links to our financial network so that they have that incubation uh, and acceleration support. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, there's a digital transformation, I'm sure is something which, which we'll probably pick up in, in the Q&A. That is something that's you know, really going to be affecting the NHS over the next 10 years. Uh, I'd like to invite Carol at this point to, to step in with the view of a small business um, that, that's, that's been doing some transformative work for, for our health service. Thanks, Annette. Um, I think I'll be talking from a slightly different perspective um, from the other speakers, actually, because we're probably further back down that supply chain and supporting companies who are developing products to then sell to the NHS. So we're not working directly with the NHS, but I've been asked to make a few um, comments and reflections on how we've worked to try and transform the industry that we're in from the perspective of changing hearts and minds, really. Um, so I would say that um, we know that ultimately consumers out in the world are becoming much more ethically conscious um, and are really increasingly aware of how their purchases are affecting things like the environment and animal welfare. And in particular, the cosmetics industry, who we work with a lot, um, they're very prone to, to trends and, and there's lots of things that come and go. And one of the latest things is blue beauty, um, as in products that are kind to the ocean. Um, but I think that it's about going deeper within any industry, really, and thinking about what does cruelty free, for example, actually mean? There could be um, a product that hasn't been tested on animals, so it ticks the box of um, cruelty free in the broad in the, the narrow sense but in a broader sense is it truly cruelty free if it contains a natural ingredient that has required some deforestation to grow that crop um, or has it been fair to the, um, the the local communities that are working in those environments has it had any impact on wildlife um, for example if it has destroyed a habitat so there's a really much broader view now being taken across the industry about what is sustainable and how do we define these terms. And I would say that um, one of the big things, as we all know, across the world now is a, a trend towards veganism. And that is really um, coming to the fore, even in science. So one of the points I wanted to make is that scientific research isn't immune to the vegan and animal welfare trends, which might seem a bit woo woo, a bit out there, but actually it's going through all the threads of science now. And for example, as a testing lab, we've always eradicated animal derived components from the tests that we provide. And we've done that for a variety of ethical and scientific reasons over the years. But what's happened now is that 
that is starting to be recognised as an important factor so that we can do what is now coined vegan testing. Now, we didn't develop it as vegan testing per se, but so many companies are now developing vegan products that it would be hypocritical to test those in a way that is using animal derived components, even if it's a, a lab based method. So I think the trend here is all about authenticity and transparency and helping people to understand what the successes currently are, but also what are the challenges. Um, and I guess just one point I wanted to bring in is that I think that it does help companies if they can align with the bigger picture. Um, for example, the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. And for us as an SME, I think it can feel quite overwhelming to think, well, there's so many issues in the world. How are we going to um, tackle this? But to suddenly see your part in something bigger. And what we're doing at Accelerate aligns with SDG 12, which is all about um, sustainable production, responsible production and consumption. And that talks about the human relationship with other animals on the planet and with the environment right through the supply chain. So from the invention of a new chemical or ingredient or component of a medical device through to the testing, um, and then what happens after use when that go, goes back into the environment? We need to consider the biodegradability and go all the way through the, the life cycle of that product. Um, and I would say really, um, you know, it's clear that everybody needs to get on the bus with this now. We can't get left behind. And that would be my, um, my sort of parting thought really, is that there is this need to be authentic, there is a need to be transparent and to share the journey with whoever your customers are, whether they're um, consumers, whether they're industry, whether they're NHS stakeholders. I think often companies are too slow to share their successes, are also too slow to share the challenges. And it can feel a little bit overwhelming if you think, well, we're not there yet, so we can't start shouting about achieving one thing because somebody's going to pick up and say that we're hypocritical not having the full solution in place. But I think it's important to bring all stakeholders, whatever environment you're in, on that journey and say, we're really trying to get there, but we can't do it all yet and, and we need your support. And I would say, ultimately, this is very much a commercial need, too, because any businesses that don't move with these kind of changes and, and become more progressive really risk being superseded by organisations who do. Um, and that was probably the, the, the main points that I wanted to share. Brilliant, Carol. There's so much um, to pick up on there. Uh, I, I totally um, resonate with what you were saying around um, sustainable crops. And palm oil is, of course, one of the key examples of that. And, and Unilever, who is one of our partners in Net Zero North, is, is very focused, very focused on that, as, I, as I'm sure you can see from their, their advertisements. And, and, and they don't do it because it's good. It's just, you know, it's just nice to do. They do it because it's every time somebody buys a product, they're making a choice to be more ethical or, or, or whatever. So, uh, yeah, so loads to pick up on there in the, in the Q&A. And I would just remind everybody uh, who's uh, watching, please do pop your Q&A into the, into the little Q&A box there um, as we're on to our, our final speaker, uh, Emma Degg from Northwest, Best, Northwest Business Leaders. Oh, thank you very much. I won't talk for long because I know uh, the Q&A will as ever be the most um, important point. But to start off um, in terms of context from a, a group of big businesses really, and Carol is exactly right, even if this wasn't the right thing to do for the planet, it's becoming an existential threat for business if we don't move. BlackRock's latest market statement made it pretty clear that in terms of where they invest in the future, they're going to be looking at companies proving exactly what they're doing around this agenda. So there's, there's a whole other conversation to be had about how we measure and how we procure, which is a cross-sectoral issue, I think. So. But just very quickly, um, Emma mentioned the government's 10 point plan, and because of that, it sort of triggered me. Um, the Northwest wasn't mentioned in the 10, government's 10 point plan, 
So it's always worth reminding ourselves of actually the scale of the opportunity, but also the challenge in the Northwest. So we're the third biggest region in the UK, bigger than any of the devolved nations, um, and our economy is worth 180 billion pounds. We've got the largest concentration of advanced manufacturing and chemicals production in the country, and that comes at a cost. So we produce just from that part of our sector around 40 million tonnes of CO2 every year. So the business leadership team established a new cluster group um, around four years ago now, actually, to look at how we could increase collaboration to actually get to a point where we knew what roadmap we needed to tackle that challenge. And we wanted to, number one, raise the profile of what the region's got to offer, uh, work together to increase investment, but also, as I say, turn this into tangible, well, what do we need to do about it? Um, so with partners, uh, we work together on a UKRI funded uh, phase one of an industrial decarbonisation roadmap that was published last summer. Um, it's multi-vector. Um, and we also last summer established a new collaboration um, funded entirely by the private sector that brings together high energy consumers with investors and um, our local enterprise partnerships and mayors actually in one place. It, it's chaired by... Carl Ennis, uh, MD at Siemens, um, and uh, we're very much focused on what practical approaches we need to take and how we can work together. And just to give you an idea of the geography, it stretches from Flintshire and Wrexham through Cheshire, Liverpool City region, Greater Manchester, Lancashire and Cumbria. Uh, and a new report that's not actually been published yet, but I'm hoping nobody's going to quote me, um, has just uh, been produced by Siemens. Uh, which shows that projects that we already have, have the potential to attract £207 billion pounds of inward investment, grow the UK economy, uh, create over 650,000 new jobs and reduce CO2 emissions by over 38 million tonnes. Um, so that all sounds like very big numbers and everybody's talking in big numbers and big datelines. We genuinely believe that this is about a year by year, decade by decade roadmap that's got to be across sectors. We've heard some brilliant stuff uh, from the NHS um, already this afternoon. Well, how do we learn from that? How do we do things together? How do we make, we know that the answers rest partly in our universities, partly are about deployment, partly about making sure that this is part of leveling up. How do we get the right skills? Uh, how do we make sure regulation is in the right place? And how do we make this something that's actually meaningful uh, rather than just about big visions? So um, that's why I think this is a fantastic event. The more we collaborate, the more we talk, the more we knit the spaghetti and actually get on and do things, uh, the closer we'll get to that 2040 target. So thanks, Annette. Thanks, Emma. So I'm going to um, uh, kick off the questions um, with actually um, one that's come forward from the audience, um, which links into something that Neil spoke about, uh, which is around single use uh, plastics. But more broader than that, um, uh, the questioner actually says single use seems to be the direction for most medical technologies. Um, so could you tell us a bit more about your kind of current activity in that space, Neil? You alluded to it in your, uh, in your opening remarks. Um, and, how, and how might some of the, the plastics or, or the other medical tech be made more sustainable? Well, I think we, we need to be realistic. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of single-use plastics in its entirety from the, you know, the NHS or the health sector. But I think there are opportunities. So, I mean, this... We've got a, a number of, of, of pilots underway. Some are fairly niche. So Trocars, which is a, is a port that you, you use um, during operations. In the main, that those, those are single-use ISMGs once and then binned. But actually, there's an alternative now in the market, which is reusable. Um, and actually, it, it's also cheaper. So there's a cost saving and there's an environmental saving. So those, these are the sorts. These are the sorts of projects we, we're starting to identify and you know using those in theatres, those in wards, wards to help help sort of test these out. Some of them sound very small, and you think, well, that's not going to make a difference. But actually, one of the things we're finding is we need to get people on the journey. 
which is a cliche, but it's to find things where, that, that we can do. People see it makes, it's made a difference and they will come up with the idea of the next one. So I think, it, I think you know, we, we're not easily going to find some very big wins. It's going to be lots of very small things, I think, that we can do. So that's just, that, that, that's one example, you know, in the, it, you know, you know it's in the plastic space. Yeah, that's that's great, and I think that that's that sort of leads on to um, uh, one of the uh, one of the other questions that we wanted to ask, which was around um, you know the role of of colleagues in the NHS and coming up with some of these innovations and solutions. Um, and Steve, I, I was wondering if you have anything to uh, to comment on about getting getting the workforce to think about sustainability within large organisations from the work that you've done in Siemens. Yeah, definitely, Annette, definitely. So Siemens is committed to be net carbon zero by 2030. So that's a huge challenge for us and our operations. But I find working within Siemens that the organisation is very much the catalyst for the change. So as an employee, um, slightly different for me because I'm home based anyway, but our, our office based employees are now empowered to work two to three days from home at their discretion. So that, that saves on obviously travel time, fuel, and, and, and the ultimate carbon footprint. Uh, but it also creates a healthy work-life balance for everybody as well. So yes, we've all been sort of sat behind computer screens now for the past 15, 16 months, whatever it's been. And there's days when you find that quite frustrating, but that work-life balance for not the, the normal nine to five is, is a big uh, a big play now for Siemens. So that, that is mandated now across globally across Siemens that, you're really entitled to work from home two to three days a week. Um, as a business, we promote green travel, so um, we are incentivized to buy greener cars or have greener company cars, should we say, um, and also take up public transport and use that for the public transport, certainly for longer journeys for, for customers it's when, we, uh, when we get back to that point in time. So. Thanks, Steve. And, and Ian, uh, is there anything you'd like to add on, on, on the point of engaging with the workforce? Yeah, I'd say so, because it's something that comes through across my desk quite often. We've got about twelve to 14,000 staff, so um, there's always people who can identify areas like they were saying for slimlining and reducing waste. And I think it's great now that the work is happening regionally and nationally, because some of the examples I, I've had um, was a piece of kit that came with a, I think, 150 page instruction document in 36 different languages. But the department at Ruth Theatres um, used about 30 of those a day. And every day they had to take the pack out, put the instruction guide in straight in the bin because they didn't need it 30 times every day, every day of the year. Another one was a procedure pack. So quite often in theatres, they'll have one pack which has ev everything that's needed for an operation. And um, RAP, who uh, the waste um, resource program, came in to do an audit. And one of the procedure packs had a gown that was of unsuitable quality. So every operation, someone would open the pack, throw the gown straight in the bin, get a gown off the shelf. And there wasn't the mechanism to be able to change that procedure pack. It was just accepted how it is. And I think because there's so many trusts and so many examples like that, it's, it's impossible for one person or one organisation to do that. So this work that Neil's talking about where they're looking at the top 500 suppliers and single-use plastics and trying to target things at a regional or national level to make those small changes will be rolled out really quickly. So I think that that's the best thing for staff engagement for me is for people on the floor to identify the waste and that there is now a route that we can we can process that and try and make some changes. Great. Um, there's a there's a question um, that's coming from again from the audience, which is around um, the energy footprint associated by digitisation. I think we're all aware that increasing digitisation comes with trade offs around energy use. Um, and I wondered um, whether any any of the panel are able to talk about how you how you think about those trade offs that are. The, you know, the, the increasing energy footprint that comes with the increase in digitization compared to uh, you know carbon reductions. Um, Emma, is that something that that you know is something that gets talked about in your cluster? 
Yes. And, and I, I, yes. Oh, sorry, Emma. Sorry. <laughs> Two Emmas, my fault. Um, Emma, South Wales Sandler, do you want to go first and then Emma Degg? Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Uh, well, just, so just quickly, uh, that's something that's very much at the forefront forefront of, of our minds. And um, I know particularly at RAL, we've just put PV out across a lot of the buildings, the roofs. So trying to offset that additional energy use by bringing in further renew, renewable energy. Uh, and at the moment, that's solar and PV. But, you know, the aim of digitising the campus is to reduce that energy uh, or, or <clears throat> to reduce our footprint. So, you know, we really need to make sure that we're offsetting that uh, and that that's taken into account. And also so there's significant differences in heating, cooling, um, you know, look, looking in, looking at bringing in these different technologies and, and especially around battery energy storage, you know, what savings can we really make so that we're not just increasing our consumption? Great, Emma, Emma Deck, did you have anything to add? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it's possible to walk and chew gum at the same time, really. So um, through the Made Smarter Northwest Digitisation Project, one of the things that's being measured and looked at in terms of the next phase is actually the impact of digitisation uh, on net zero. And the truth is, for, for an awful lot of manufacturing companies, digitising processes becoming more efficient in itself saves carbon and saves energy. So, so it's not quite as straightforward as, well, if you're digitizing, that means you're using more power, but it does mean uh, across everything that we need to have to, to not be thinking about net zero or sustainability in one box. It has to be part of a round. Um, at, at, that, that's the other reason why having these regular conversations across sectors, across different sorts of businesses really helps because we can learn from each other in terms of what some of those hidden costs possibly are and what the solutions are. We don't have to keep, every business shouldn't be having to look at what they can do uh, individually. There's got to be some better best pra practice sharing across all of this. So, thanks, Emma. Um, I just wanted to um, put a question to Carol really around culture change and thinking um, one of the kind of question um, points that was being made was that that consumers vote with their wallet every every time they they buy something, and and thinking about the you know one point three billion million workforce and goodness knows how many million um, users of NHS services. How can we um, think about culture change around sustainability in the round of people engaging with hospital services as an, as an opportunity to engage them with this whole kind of sustainability agenda? I think it's, it's a really good question because the, the public, I think, uh, they won't hesitate to put pressure on industries that they buy directly from and are making those very tangible choices with their wallet day to day when they go out to the shop. Um, but when it's something that is a little bit disguised behind the scenes, they wouldn't necessarily think about what's going on in, in the NHS. So I think there's an education piece there because ultimately industry has shown, you know, that the trends in industry have shown that it is public um, opinion and public pressure that ultimately drives change, you know, whether that goes via the regulators or whether it's voluntarily coming from industry responding to those needs. So I think it's um, there's a piece there for getting that discussion going and, and helping people to understand that, you know, there are ways of changing, but knowing that we can't do it all as well. I, I think there's um, just coming back to what I said earlier about um, everything that you do, every little action and every, every choice does make a difference and empowering people to understand that does make a difference. And just because the NHS can't do it all yet, well, there are some things, some little tangible steps, and we've heard about some of those today that are significant. So I think it's about celebrating successes, getting people infused um, behind the drive and, and, you know, just doing as much as we can really. Brilliant. Thanks, Carol. Well, on that kind of note, it segues us nicely into our final uh, final question, which is really, you know, we've, it's important for us all to take small steps. And uh, I want to ask the, the panel, what's what's one thing that you're doing uh, to reduce your own carbon footprint? 
um, in whether that's at work or, or uh, uh, at home. And I'll go first. Cheers, privilege. Uh, so I, so I've I've switched to green energy uh, as as part of my, one of the many things that I've done to lower my carbon footprint. So I'm going to go around the panel in the in the order they spoke. So uh, Ian, if I can ask you, what have you done? Yeah, well, one of the things that I've done, which turned out very happily to be very COVID um, resistant, was uh, just in the probably the three months before the pandemic, I'd moved to. Uh, the home delivery from the milkman of organic local milk, uh, including oat milk from Lancashire, which is amazing. Um, and we went to a, a, a um, organic veg box for fortnightly delivery. Then suddenly no one could go to a supermarket and we, we were totally secure because going back to the old fashioned ways meant that everything carried on as it was. So it was something that was more sustainable, but actually uh, was very, um, very resilient to the changes that we had as well last year. Yep, and that alludes to the local procurement as well, which uh, we were hearing about earlier. Yeah. So that's brilliant. Uh, Neil, what about you? Uh uh, yeah, I switched to a, a plug-in hybrid vehicle. Um, not quite brave enough yet to go to a full electric vehicle, but maybe the next stage. Excellent. And Steve? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, very much the same as Neil. So I've switched to a, a plug-in hybrid. Not quite there yet with the full electric, but uh, I think my, my next purchase will be, uh, as well as that, a bit like yourself and that, I have 100% green electric from the, from the grid. Um, I'm currently actually looking at a ground source heat pump as well, so just trying to model that uh, that impact that that will have for me. So. Fantastic. Uh, that, that's really exciting. Heat pumps are, are technology for the future, definitely. And mm -hmm. the green, yeah. So. Great to see how that goes. Emma Southwell Sander, please. Uh, yeah, we've we've switched to green energy at home, and I'm going to try and cycle to work, which is about five miles up across the Ridgeway. So fingers crossed uh, that that goes well. No, that would be lush, and it's just absolutely beautiful uh, uh, around the Ridgeway. So I'm very jealous uh, that you can do that. Uh, Carol, have you got any uh, any ideas for reducing uh, your green? Green. Yeah, I guess uh, given near the end, you have to try and think of something different. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we've done is start to do a lot more home cooking, which I think has been very conducive when we've been working from home anyway. But that makes you realise how much plastic packaging there is on everything when you go to the supermarket. So when I am doing the shop, I'm really conscious of absolutely minimising um, the, you know, the amount of, of plastic waste. Fantastic. And again, last but not least, Emma, can you can you finish us finish us off? No, I can just agree with Ian and, and Carol. Partly COVID, partly other things. I've uh, been shopping at my local green grocers, which means that, and it wasn't to reduce plastic. You just realise actually, where's all the plastic gone? My plastic recycling is now half, you know, is virtually empty each week. So yeah. That's brilliant. I think it's really great, you know, like we hope that big organisations will share uh, tips for reducing carbon footprint. I think, you know, we can all share share ideas and I'm rushing out to my greengrocers. That's food waste is massive uh, uh, yeah, for, for carbon emissions. So I think that's that's definitely a tip I'll be taking from today's session. I'd just like to um, really thank the brilliant panel that we've had to, together this afternoon that have had a really great discussion about sustainability in the health and life sciences sector. I know that, um, that if you want to get in touch with them outside of the meeting to build on any of the ideas that they've brought forward or have any questions, I know that, that, that Phil Carvel from the Health Tech Cluster will be delighted to network you up together. Um, so thanks for joining us at this session.